I'd like to introduce Rachel and have her take over and speak about her work. Thank you. Thank you, JD, and um, it's a pleasure to be here, and I do want to thank the students who helped me hang it so quickly. You guys were great. Um, and thank you all for coming to see my exhibit of Being in Significance. This, um, this exhibit was inspired by a butterfly I found, and its wings were not closed or all the way open, but it was half open as if it wanted to take one more flap but just couldn't. I created the whole series um, from a single woodcut of the butterfly. As I changed the colors and cut it up and sewed it back together, I also had this conversation with the work and wrote um, poetry. So you'll see in the exhibit that there's poems for each of the pieces. Um, each po image and poem is meant to take the viewer through the life cycle of the butterfly and to see the significance of even the smallest creature to all of creation, including us. I look at aspects of change and transformation, vulnerability and waiting, stewardship in the environment, hope and the joys of flight. I thought that I would begin um, with a look at some of the works that and the thinking that went in um, prior to these uh, to this series. So every piece of art that we make grows out of it, our experiences and those things that inspire us. One of the earliest poems that I remember is the poem Halfway Down by A. A. Milne. This poem still speaks into my life and into my work. And uh, here's the poem. Halfway down the stairs is a stair where I sit. There isn't any other stair quite like it. I'm not at the bottom and I'm not at the top. So this is the stair where I always stop. Halfway up the stairs isn't up. It isn't down. It isn't in the nursery. It isn't in town. And all sorts of funny thoughts run round my head. It isn't really anywhere. It's somewhere else instead. Much of my work wrestles with the fact that we live in the gap between life as it is and life as it ought to be. Life is hard but we catch glimpses of what it should look like. And so here we sit, not at the bottom and not at the top. And along the way, I make art that expresses what this gap looks like and the hope that keeps us going. So this is um, one of my earliest woodcuts. Undergraduate, I studied mainly painting. And um, so but I love color, and, um, but by the end of undergraduate, I was making a lot of prints. And so I went on to graduate school and, and study printmaking. What drew me to printmaking was the fact that it is a problem-solving process. You have an end image or end goal in mind, and you have to create the steps and the plates that get you there. It ties to my interest in this idea that the journey is about getting to a destination. And it also relates to uh, my somewhat mathematical mind that's always creating problems for me to solve. Furthermore, I enjoy the three-dimensional qualities of prints and that you can make multiple copies of them. So for this particular piece, I created six blocks of wood, um, which I carved, and then I printed one on top of each other um, in different colors. Um, I wanted a, a little bit simpler technique, so I tried this next. Um, in this case, I made a key block, which I printed in red, and then I took a second block and I cut it up like a jigsaw puzzle, and I inked each of those little puzzle pieces and I reassembled them and I printed that onto paper and then I printed the key block over it. Um, so that was kind of my second step in the journey of making color woodcuts. This is the third step and is pretty much the technique I use today where I'm carving a key block and I'm applying hand color. Um, and so technically it wouldn't be a, a traditional kind of print because you always would want to be printing everything. But I like that the colors remain fresh and I like that um, I can apply as many colors as I want. Um, 
and I feel like if it's really well lit, you really think of it. A lot of people go, it looks like stained glass. It has that kind of tr translucence, so exciting, vivid color. Okay. Um, so in my work, I use a lot of aspects of architecture, geometry, and map making. And I use this to imply kind of the multiple layers of the inner life. Um, I, I think that the geometry adds a structure to my work and it suggests absolutes. Um, my images sometimes adhere to the structure and they sometimes don't. In architecture, for example, buildings adhere to that structural grid, um, whereas in maps, we impose that to kind of pinpoint our location, but actually the landscape is wild and free um, below that, that imposed grid. And what I love about architecture is it can sometimes suggest a real sense of presence and awe. Okay, so this piece, I used to play with um, this thing, these things called triominoes. They're like dominoes, but they're three-sided. Um, and so I kind of created this piece based on that. Um, and this is about the triune nature of God. So the top section is God, the, um, the ultimate puzzle piece, the creator of the universe, the master architect, and the provider. And then um, the bottom right-hand side is the spirit, uh, fire, winds, uh, teacher. And then the bottom left is Jesus, the gate, the shepherd, the king, the light, and he's wounded. And because I can make multiples, I can make lots of copies of it and do fun things with it. So this one is six of them. And when I do this, it, it starts drawing out the, the patterns in the, the pieces. Okay, this one's called Crossroads. Um, and this is interesting. So I, when I finished under, um, when I finished undergraduate school, I worked in landscape architecture and land planning. And so I did a lot of drawings like this for them. Um, and so, you know, you can put your skills to use. As, as artists, um, and that's one way I did it. Um, and in this piece, I'm looking at aspects of community. Where do we come together in community? Uh, do we meet on the highway where my neighbor is that jerk in the car next to me that I can say whatever I want to because my windows are rolled up and we're just passing by each other on bridges? And so this was kind of my modern commentary of that, that our highways can be this kind of scar to our landscape. And um, walking you through my map, um, I have kind of my landscape of separations. So we have on the bottom right is uh, a suburban subdivision where we all have our separate houses on our separate lots. Um, bottom left is a office park. Uh, the top right is our shopping mall with ample parking. And on the upper left, I was having a little fun, so I took a plan of 18th century Rome and I updated it to have cul-de-sacs and parking lots. Um, and so, you know, obviously this is a shape of a cross, so the question is, do we cross over each other or do we meet at the cross? So, um, I'm kind of envious of Renaissance artists because they had a system of symbolism uh, to convey the identity of the people and the ideas in their images. This uh, symbolism would be commonly understood by their audience. In um, our contemporary culture, we don't really have that kind of uh, common, commonly understood symbolism. But in my work, I try to create my own symbolic language to convey ideas and identity. So this piece is all about um, the invitations of life, um, why I accept them, why I don't, what excuses I make, um, who will be there, what will I wear, what will be expected of me. Um, and when I was thinking about that, I was also thinking about how the Bible says that God is preparing a table for me in the presence of my enemies. And I wasn't sure I liked the sound of that. Um, 
and who was going to be at the table with me. So it kind of created this idea, okay, what does this table look like? Um, and of course I looked at Leonardo's Last Supper and I started creating this table. And I didn't want the people at the table to be literal people because sometimes the enemy that I bring to the table is myself, my own issues. So um, I'll kind of walk you through the, the enemies at my table. Uh, we have uh, the clock over on the left for time. Uh, I have, the first plate is, has money on it um, for greed. I have lemons for bitterness. And there's a crock pot full of snakes for deceit. Um, and then if you go over to the other side, we have a plate with a gun on it. So that's my anger, or if we use our anger, maybe we have regret. Um, there's a broken vase for brokenness and an upside down book for ignorance. And then there's this place set for me, and I go, do I like what's being offered? You know, you got dry bread and, and this cup that's running over. So I have to kind of wrestle with what's, what's being offered. And when I looked at Leonardo's Last Supper, I was really, really drawn to the fact that there was this beautiful landscape in the background. And I was thinking, what if I look at life's invitations as more than just what the immediate thing is, um, but that they're actually an invitation to growth and a more spacious life. So in this piece, I took that broken vase that you saw on the table. It was a, a vase that I'd smash with a hammer and tried to crazy glue back together. And I wanted it to be life-size. So it's actually, a, you know, it looks like a portrait size. And I was thinking about how life smashes us and we're, we're trying to pick up the pieces and stick them back together, but they never really fit quite the same. And so we're left with these cracks and we have to decide, is it worth the risk? You know, is life worth the risk? Um, and if we decide yes, then we have to accept the fact that we will be broken and that it will require some mending and it will never be perfect again. But what's cool is this vase is lit from the inside because of the cracks you can see what I've learned and who, how I've grown. So this piece is um, called For Those in Captivity. Um, so sometimes um, works grow out of uh, a sense of uh, a, a story that somebody tells me. And this one was came from a friend of mine who told me a story about her and her husband. They were in this cage. She had a dream they were in this cage and that she could see the cage was open and he could not. Um, and it didn't surprise me because at the time he was in deep depression. And, um, and so, but I thought this is a great symbol of how we live our lives. Um, and we sometimes think we're very limited, that, that we have these self-imposed limitations. So on the left, you have your truncated bird man. He can't even see his own reflection in the mirror because he's blindfolded. And, um, and then she is up at the top. She's singing this song into his ear. And uh, I always think of that as a song of hope. And um, on the right-hand side, you can see the cage is open and the blindfold is off. Um, art needs to have body and it needs to have soul. Body is the physical form of the art. This is where technique, craftsmanship, composition, and aesthetics come to play. Strong body or form gives the content power. Soul is the content or expression of, of the meaning of the work. However, to truly have soul, a work must have more than just subject matter. It must have some sort of transcendence. That's why I like the word soul. An artwork with soul transports the viewer and speaks with a prophetic voice, speaking into and creating culture. But if art is prophetic, then I, have, as an artist, have a responsibility for what I create. That responsibility, I believe, is two-pronged. First, I'm socially responsible for the works I create. The content should be relevant, accessible, and helpful. 
And secondly, I'm spiritually responsible to develop an inner life so that the voice of my art comes from a place of wisdom.